two and a half miles off the coast of Calde Island. Calde is, with good reason, sometimes described as the Island of Saints, for it was the site of a monastery as long ago as the 6th century, St. David and many other saints living on the island for a time. All that is left of these early beginnings is this priory and church, dating from the 12th century, built by monks from St. Dogmal's Abbey near Cardigan. Though it continued for four centuries, it never achieved much distinction, and in 1907 the island was purchased by a community of Anglican Benedictines, and under the guidance of the abbot Dom Aylred, a fine modern abbey arose on the hilltop. This is now occupied and the island owned by a community of Cistercian monks from the Abbey of Lime in Belgium. When their church was destroyed by fire, they built this lovely modern style church. These monks are of a different type from their predecessors, being commonly known as Trappists, from the reforms which took place at the monastery of La Trappe in the 17th century. They maintain a way of life which is strictly religious and agricultural. Most of them are under a vow of silence and have little contact with the outside world. A monk's life is a busy one. If he is of the choir religious, most of his time is devoted to chanting the divine office or to study. If he is a lay brother, he will do the ordinary manual work of a farming community. The island is farmed by modern means, and the monks, being vegetarian, are self-supporting. The soil of Calde is very fertile, and crops mature about a month earlier than on the mainland. Cattle were once made to make the long swim to the mainland behind boats, but today they are carried in crates, two at a time, in the monks' boat, the Lollipop, a converted liberty boat built by the Admiralty. It can carry 28 passengers or five tons of merchandise. As the lollipop is the only transport, in bad weather the island is often cut off for days, though contact with the mainland is maintained by radio telephone. has about 20 inhabitants, mostly retired people, who find peace on this lovely island. Most of the cottages, with the post office, lie in the shadow of the monastery, and great credit must go to the hard-working monks who have brought progress and prosperity to the island while living their life of prayer and dedication. Just a short stretch from the island is Tenby. Its south sands stretch for two miles and are a children's paradise. Although, as one of the main holiday resorts, its job is to give people a good time, it is not without history. This well-preserved section of the town wall was first started in the 14th century. The gateway, known as the Five Arches, is believed to date from the 15th. In 1873, the bastion was destined for destruction and was only saved by the efforts of a resident who appealed to the Court of Chancery for an injunction against the would-be destroyers. This important-looking fort on St. Catherine's Rock was built to guard the approach to Pembroke Dock, and it is at Pembroke that we see one of the outstanding ruins of the kingdom, Pembroke Castle one of the largest and, at the time it was built, one of the strongest, it is justly regarded as the most picturesque and magnificent castle in the country. It was here in 1457 that King Henry VII was born, and though he lived here only 10 years before being forced to flee, we can easily imagine how the young king must have been thrilled to see the knights of old gather for their tournament, or a lonely soldier on sentinel at the top of the magnificent hundred-foot-high round keep, hearing the sounds of knights in jousting tournaments competing for their ladies' favour.
and still today the sounds of tournament carry on. Not the clash of armor, but of racket upon ball. And still the trumpet rings out, but in a different key. No, progress does not stand still. And here in Milford Haven Dock, we can see how the old is reluctant to give way to the new. HMS Warrior, the first ironclad, and once the largest and most powerful man of war in the world, still clung to old ideas. Laid down in 1859, it had a speed of 14 knots. She is a link between the old and new, and like the Warrior, Milford Haven has made changes. Once an important center of naval industry, Constructing the old-fashioned war frigates, the new Milford Haven has been organized as a fishing port. And these great docks now have ample facilities for handling and dispatching the enormous catches of fish. In this large market, the fish is packed, and special express fish trains leave the docks twice daily for delivery at early morning markets, leaving the gannets and the seagulls to squabble over the pickets. Life is easier for these birds than those that nest on this wonderful natural arch near St. Govan's Chapel. St. Govan's is built across a ravine which forms the only approach to the sea for several miles. Tradition has it that this spot was the retreat of Arthur's knight Gawain, and that a thief that St. Govan hid in a chamber behind the altar was crushed to death when the rocks moved, leaving the impression of his body in the rock. Below the chapel is a well and ringing stone. One knocks two stones together and makes a wish. The well was believed to have had great powers of healing, some cripples coming to it as late as 1840. Surely the greatest pilgrimage of all is to St. David's. It is situated at the extreme western point of Wales and dominated by its cathedral, which has made this village city famous. Built down in the valley, one suddenly comes upon the cathedral in all its splendor. And from the top of these steps, known as the 39 Articles on account of the number, one can see the ruins of the huge 14th century Episcopal Palace. The first church, or cathedral, was built on the spot where the present building stands in the 6th century by St. David and his monks, but it was burnt down in 645. The austere exterior of the cathedral leaves one quite unprepared for the lovely interior. The nave is the most ancient part of the present edifice and goes back to the 12th century. One of the choir stalls is reserved for the reigning king or queen of England, who on ascending the throne is recognized as a canon of the cathedral. Once an open courtyard used as a waiting place for pilgrims, 
is the Holy Trinity Chapel. And behind its high altar lie what are believed to be the remains of St. David. For many years, the shrine of St. David was venerated to a great degree, and two pilgrimages to it were looked upon as being equal to one to Rome. And surely, all must have found it the brightest jewel in the crown of loveliness that is Pembrokeshire. 